Hey everybody, Drillin' in the name of here and Hoxis, we have a problem. In this installment of my deep dive series, we're going to be talking about the problem with bots. I'm going to go over each individual rival tech enemy in detail, from stats that may surprise you, enemy comparisons, and some really interesting bot mechanics. Then I'll discuss how the rival tech has changed the overall Deep Rock experience and conclude with what I might change to make that experience more enjoyable. But I do want to say something quickly before we get started. I love Deep Rock. I can confidently say it's in my top 5 favorite games of all time. The only reason I mention that is when I make a video like this where I'm critical of an aspect of the game, I want it to be clear that it's because I feel really invested in DRG at this point, and not just because I felt like making a video to complain about something. The folks at Ghost Ship seem like truly great people, and I don't take lightly the concept of criticizing something they clearly have spent a lot of time on. So when I do, it's because I have a very strong feeling about something, and I want to share it in a way that is hopefully constructive. Moving on. The first two seasons of Deep Rock Galactic have introduced the Rival Tech, a rival mining corporation that brings with it a whole new class of enemy, a new mission type, a new mission warning, and several new mission events. Now I'm always excited about new Deep Rock content, so I couldn't wait to see what all this robot stuff was about. The designs were really cool, the trailers were really intriguing, and it was also different from anything we'd seen on Hoxis to that point. Fast forward to just over a year and a half later, and I'm truly sad to say the bots just have not grown on me. I'll get into the bigger picture of why I say that later, but first, let's go over the bots themselves. First up, we have the Patrol Bot. These are extremely fast, agile, and very powerful. They have four methods of attack, a burst shot, a laser shot, homing missiles, and a rolling melee attack. The number of different attacks alone sets them apart from most enemies, but when you factor in their speed and unpredictability, they can quickly become very frustrating opponents. For starters, their base HP is 900. <sighs> if he's not going to explain that, I guess I will. The difficulty in Deep Rock Galactic scales based on has level and the number of people you're playing with. This determines everything from the number of enemies per spawn, enemy movement speed, and enemy attack and resistance stats. I put together this chart which you can reference throughout the video to calculate enemy attack stats for the has level and number of players you typically choose, which you can find in the description. Base stats in DRG refer to hazard level 2 with 4 players, and everything scales from there. So if you don't really play Has 4 with 3 of your friends, take the base damage stat he references and multiply that number by 2.5. Or if you normally play has 3 by yourself, take that same number and multiply it by 1.2. As for enemy HP, that gets a little more complicated because that number scales based on the size of the enemy. The DRG wiki has a great chart for this, which I'll make sure he links to in the description as well. Back to the video. This is pretty staggering because that's actually the same amount as an oppressor. Now to be fair, the patrol bot has significant elemental weaknesses, while oppressors have significant elemental resistances, and the patrol bot's weak point is three times weaker. But their weak point is pretty small, and their movement is so erratic that unless you're using highly accurate weapons like the GK2 with AI stability engine, or the minigun with improved platform stability, it's pretty difficult to consistently hit that weak point. And even though it may be a bit of an apples to oranges comparison, I do think it's worth mentioning because if you look at these enemies from the ground up, you have a big slow tanky enemy and a small fast flying enemy, so starting them from the same spot in terms of HP feels a little off. As for their attacks, these feel a little overpowered. First up, the burst shot does 4 base damage at 3 shots per burst for a total of 12 damage if all 3 shots land. They perform this attack while rolling around in their evasive mode, which, unless I'm mistaken, makes them the only enemy outside of a nemesis in their force field attack that can fire a projectile without stopping their movement first. Next up, a direct hit from the laser attack does 16 base damage split between kinetic and explosive. By contrast, an acid spit attack usually does 17.5 to 20 base damage, including the poison DOT. This just feels a little imbalanced to me, considering acid spitters have just over a tenth the HP of a troll bot, and they sit still when firing their projectiles. Then there are the homing missiles, which in my opinion are the most problematic of the patrol bot attacks. With a direct hit, these do 6 total base damage per missile at 4 missiles per attack. In this clip, I'm playing solo on has 5, and if I let all 4 missiles hit me, it takes me from full health and shields to under a sixth of my health. Now you may say the odds of being hit by all 4 missiles is pretty low, but if you're playing on has 5, there's usually about 3 bots per wave, so you may be dodging homing missiles from more than one patrol bot. Aside from doing a ton of damage, they can lock onto you from just about anywhere, and they don't even need to be within view to hit you. This isn't that uncommon either. These two clips are actually from the exact same mission. It just doesn't feel great to be hit by an enemy that's behind cover, especially when there seems to be no limit to their range. Here I'm trying to blow up these exploding plants to damage this patrol bot, which by the way is 43 meters away, and it still hits me with its missiles. 
The one saving grace is if you need any more reasons to be a driller, is that you can drill these out of the sky without taking damage, and you even get HP if you're using the vampire perk. Lastly, their rolling melee attack does 6 base damage. For the sake of comparison, a Kronar Younglings rolling attack does 7 base damage. Aside from all the numbers, they also have some pretty incredible evasive maneuverability, whether it's long arcing dives or short quick dodges. In this clip, I thought I had a pretty easy zip and power attack, but it moved just out of reach at the last possible moment. They just cover such an insane amount of ground, and you really can't ever predict where they're going to go. Like with a lot of bot related things, I don't mind this in theory, but it's taken to such an extreme that I don't really find it enjoyable. So they have a lot of HP, a weak point that's tough to hit, a multitude of ranged attacks plus a melee attack, and wildly unpredictable lateral and vertical movement. This unfortunately all adds up to what oftentimes, at least on Has 5, feels like a pretty unfair enemy. Now I've seen a lot of people argue that you can strafe the projectile attacks pretty easily, and that's certainly true if there's just one of them, but when you add a couple more, plus a cloud of shredders and all the other enemies that has 5 swarm throws your way, it's really no longer that simple. It's also worth taking into consideration that projectile speed also scales with has level. You could also argue that Mactera move around to evade fire, but they do so within a pretty fixed range, whereas a patrol bot will just take a pot shot and then move completely freely throughout the environment. One silver lining is that there is a chance a patrol bot becomes hackable when it's killed. If its lights turn yellow and it slowly floats to the ground, you have 30 seconds to hack it and have it join your team, Steve style. The downside is if you don't hack it in time, it comes back to life with about a quarter of its health and you have to fight it all over again. I really do like the high risk, high reward option of trying to get a patrol bot on your side during a swarm, but I'm not crazy about it being able to revive. They can float out of reach pretty easily, and if you're in the middle of a swarm and can't get to it in time, it could be really deflating having to fight a powerful enemy twice. But hacked bots are really helpful for doing damage in your favor, especially because their laser attack does more damage after they've been hacked. And they also become the priority target for other bots, which takes some of the heat off of you. However, their lifespan is naturally limited because they gradually lose HP over time, whether they're being attacked or not. Onto the turrets of which we have three kinds, Burst, Sniper, and Repulsion. Let's start with the burst turrets, which have a base HP of 750. This surprised me much like the patrol bots, because that's the same base HP as a Praetorian. Now again, I know that it's not a totally fair comparison, as the burst turrets have significant weaknesses while the Praetorians have none. But again, if you strip them down to their basics, it seems odd for a small, rapid-firing projectile enemy to have the same base HP as a big, slow, tanky enemy. Especially when you're usually facing a much higher number of turrets than you are Praetorian. They also have a protective shield that lowers once you're in range, but that's occasionally unreliable. As for damage, burst turrets do 3 base damage per bullet at 6 bullets per burst. By contrast, menace do 4 base damage per projectile. They also have pretty similar base HP, though the latter has 3 much larger weak points that are obviously much easier to hit. Now if you're only facing one turret, you can do the old burst turret waltz. Menace, you're usually facing more than one of these, and at times it can look pretty absurd. More on that later. Next we have the Sniper Turrets, which do 14 total base damage split between Kinetic and Explosive, which is about the same as Mactera Spawn and Brundles. When their laser locks onto you, it means they're about to fire. Although I can't for sure verify this, it seems like they can lock onto you from just about any distance, as long as they have a sight line, and it doesn't seem to take much room to qualify as a sight line. I also discovered recently that their bullets can break terrain, so you're not even necessarily safe behind cover. And remember, sniper turrets do half their damage as direct damage and half as AoE. So if you have multiple snipers locked onto you, they can still do a good amount of damage even if you're strafing. Lastly, we have the Repulsion Turrets. Honestly, I don't have much to say about them. Their force fields do 7 base damage, which as I mentioned earlier is the same amount as a Kronar Younglings rolling attack. Now they may push you around if you get too close, but they're definitely the most avoidable of the rival tech enemies, as their attack is purely lateral. 
Simply getting above them to shoot their weak points or below them to drill their stem makes them fairly easy to deal with. But what about when you get all three types of turrets together? As I mentioned earlier, the number of turrets you can encounter in one room can be out of control, especially on the higher has levels. This looks completely insane to me, and not really what I ever pictured Deep Rock would look like. In this shot alone, you can see there are seven burst turrets around the turret controller. This is even more interesting when you consider the fact that they've already increased the spread of turrets and decreased the number of turrets surrounding a turret controller, not once, not twice, but three times through different patches. Speaking of the turret controllers, this is another Rival Tech edition that I really like on paper, but just doesn't translate well to the game for me. Despite all the changes to the spread and number of turrets, there still seems to be at times an absurd amount of them, at least on Has 5. It's pretty rare for a controller to spawn in a place with natural cover, so you either have to drill underneath and hack it from there, or you can once again take advantage of the now overpowered CRISPR and lay waste to the turrets to clear the room. But once you've done that, there's really no point in hacking the controller at all. And what if you don't have a driller on your team, or you play solo as one of the other three classes? That's clearly the conundrum with this event, because if you concentrate the majority of turrets around the controller, it limits your ability to hack it, but if you spread them out around the cave more, it makes them a lot easier to deal with individually. Now I know the turret controller only spawns in rival presence warnings and is totally optional anyway, but I can't tell you how many times it has spawned so close to the drop pod that I can't even leave the ship without taking out a bunch of turrets first. Now I do think there are some solutions to their issues, but I'll go over that in my final analysis. These little bastards are like the hornets of the rival tech enemies. They're quick, they're mean, and they hurt. They do 5 base damage per attack, which is more than double a natasite hatchling. Now the jellies may attack more often, but they're at least kind enough to float in front of your face, whereas the shredders constantly move in and out of range. Now 5 damage may not seem like much on paper, but on has 5 with 4 players, that's 17 damage, meaning it only takes 10 hits from them to kill you, even with your health and shields maxed out. Shredders also have 7 times the HP of a natasite hatchling. For those of you that use thorns for pesky enemies like this, that means shredders have just enough HP, even on has 1, to survive the perk when it's maxed out. This is also significant because you can't just one tap them with most weapons like you can the jellies. They do have a 200% weakness to melee damage, which in this case means a single pickaxe attack is enough to kill a shredder with one hit. This is certainly within the realm of possibility if you're able to focus on just the shredders themselves, but fairly unrealistic when combined with the other threats the higher has levels present. Altogether, this makes the shredders a much greater threat than the other small enemies of DRG. a little dark. Let's lighten the mood a little bit. I was just learning to love. <laughs> Much better. Lastly, we have the Nemesis, the most feared of all the rival tech enemies. It can grab you from seemingly any angle, shoot force fields, dig through terrain, and it spawns phase bombs upon its death. Now I'm totally fine with the force fields, and I honestly think it's pretty cool that they can dig, but the grab attack is where I take issue. Once a nemesis is locked onto you, it seems almost impossible to avoid the grab. Apparently a natural obstacle can stop it, but that's been pretty hit or miss in my experience. Now I've seen a lot of people say that the nemesis grab isn't that bad, but that may be a product of the has level you choose to play. Even on has 4, if you get grabbed at full health, most of the time you'll get dropped at just shy of half health. But on has 5, it doesn't just pick you up and shake you around a bit, it straight up kills you. Even taking the Healthy Resistance mod and Tier 2 of your armor to max out your total shield and health at 170, you only occasionally survive this attack, and with only a tiny sliver of health left. In this clip, the grab lasts at 6 seconds for a total of 168 damage or 28 damage per second. That's a lot. It's just kinda crazy how much damage it does, especially given the fact that you're not able to escape it. By contrast, I'm fine with not being able to escape a grabber because they themselves don't do damage and eventually release you. And I'm honestly fine with the cave leech being an insta-kill because they're a stationary enemy you can avoid by just looking up. But at least on Has 5, a nemesis is essentially a grabber with two cave leeches attached to it. And unlike those enemies, you can't shoot a teammate free, so there's really no way of escaping it. This is also interesting, because if you look at the Season 2 art, the driller is actually shooting the nemesis while being grabbed. Why can't I do that? 
Let me do that. Even a really challenging quick time event with a low probability of success would feel better than just knowing you're gonna die. This all again just unfortunately amounts to an enemy that feels more unfair than challenging. One helpful strategy is the nemesis will target an engineer's lure, so if you throw two of them, it doesn't have arms to grab you with anymore. And finally, we have the bot events. I don't have a whole lot to say, aside from make sure you have a gunner for the data deposit and a scout for the rival signal event. But the prospector's a bit of a different story. I really can't help but compare all of these bots to pre-bot enemies, and I think Betsy is what most closely resembles the Prospector. Now Betsy is triggered by proximity while the Prospector is triggered by a direct hit, and although both are totally optional to fight, it's pretty easy to accidentally activate one of them, especially when enemies can activate them as well. The main differences with the Prospector are that it moves while it's in passive mode, and it doesn't have as distinct an indicator to help you avoid it until you're ready to fight. And although a Prospector can return to passive mode like a Tyrant Weed, a Tyrant Weed doesn't move, so it's a lot easier to retreat if you're not ready. The Prospector can also be alerted by proximity after it's returned to passive mode, plus it spawns a wave of patrol bots and shredders each time it's re-engaged. Even activating a Betsy by accident only forces you to fight one enemy, so I think it's easily the most detrimental to unexpectedly start a Prospector fight. This is what I often refer to as a caught with my pants down moment, which finally brings us to the problem with bots. High damage and resistance stats are just a small part of the issue. A much larger part of the problem with bots is that they require such a specific approach. For those of you who have been screaming fire at your screen for the past 15 minutes, yes. Fire is the most effective method of attack against the bots. Fully lighting any bot on fire will instantly kill it. But is that a good thing? If a patrol bot can go from harassing me with four high-powered attacks to being incinerated at the hands of a CRISPR, are they still an enemy to be feared? If I can blaze my way through the turrets surrounding a turret controller, are they still a legitimate threat? And if I can melt a nemesis in seconds with sticky flames, are they still one of the most intimidating enemies in the game? This is what I see a lot of people point to in defense of the bots, as if to say they're not an issue if you just light them on fire. But if fire almost instantly negates the threat, that just makes them so much less interesting to me. Deep Rock has always thrived on balance. The vast majority of the time, a solid weapon build will at the very least get you through a mission, but the bots have made it so that a bad build can be mission ending. If I, for example, drop into a mission with my Cryo Freeze build and encounter a nemesis, I get that call with my pants down feeling. The only other time I've really felt that in DRG is when a Dreadnought unexpectedly spawns in a non-elimination mission. But I've experienced that maybe 10 times or less in my thousand plus hours of DRG, so I expect and welcome that feeling when I suddenly have to face an unexpected boss enemy. But I shouldn't, however, have to feel that way just because a data deposit spawned and I'm not running heat on any of my weapons. And that's what further complicates the problem with bots, which is that they're kind of everywhere now. Data deposits and rival signal events have a 22 to 27 percent chance to spawn in any mission. There seems to be some debate, but Nemesis have between a 5 and 7 percent chance to spawn at the start of any mission. Prospectors have a 50 percent chance to replace any rare enemy that spawns at the start of a mission, which is interesting because nothing else seems to spawn this way. And during Season 2, there's guaranteed to be at least one rival presence warning per 30 minute map rotation. But the bots seem to pop up more than the numbers suggest. On this map, just from tonight, you can see there are three Rival Presence Warning missions in a single biome. And earlier while doing research for this video, I entered five random solo missions just to see what I would get. The first had a Rival Signal event, the second a Nemesis, the third a Data Deposit, the fourth another Nemesis, and the fifth a Prospector. No joke. Now this is purely anecdotal, and five missions is not a great sample size, but it's pretty clear that even if you avoid Industrial Sabotage and Rival Presence warnings, there's still a pretty good chance that you'll encounter bots in some capacity. And conceptually, they're actually really cool, and I don't necessarily want to avoid them. But I also don't like the idea of always having to be prepared for them from a loadout standpoint. I don't really use heat builds with any class, so feeling like I have to change my weapons and playstyle just for the bots is a little frustrating. And during the Nemesis segment, you might have said, why not just use heightened senses? And although it does alert you to the range of the grab and allows you to escape the grab, I would say I don't ever use heightened senses, so how many goddamn things do I need to change for one enemy group? When you lay it all out, it just feels like the bots were made extremely formidable, with the balance being a significant weakness. But in the end, that balance just overpowered one damage type while ignoring or even handicapping the others. Even though at times in DRG I felt like I could have chosen a more effective loadout, I've never before felt like my loadout was flat out wrong. And that sucks because I really do think that the bots and the ideas surrounding them are really cool. So what can we do to make them better? For one thing, the attack and defense numbers I mentioned earlier could be toned down a bit. I know some of you may think the comparisons I made were unfair, but quite a few of those stats really surprised me within the context of similar enemies. They could also tone down some of the more extreme attacks. 
Maybe eliminate the patrol bot's ability to lock onto you when it can't see you, or at least limit their projectile range. And obviously the Nemesis grab being an instant kill on Has-5 is a bit much. They could either come up with a quick time event like I mentioned earlier, or something like the button mash when you get frozen. Make the button combo more complicated even. Just as long as there's some way to escape given how much damage it does per second. I also think there needs to be more balance with the status effects. I totally understand why heat would be bad for bots and cold would be not bad, but why is electricity not more effective? The bots are significantly less weak to electrocution than they are the other status effects, but as far as I know, computers don't do too well when overloaded with electricity. What if electric weapons had a small chance to cause a bot to short circuit? Maybe with patrol bots that means a slightly higher chance they become hackable, or with turrets a small chance they turn on the other bots. We already know turrets prioritize their attacks on hacked patrol bots, so theoretically this mechanic should be possible. Plus, all four classes have weapons that do electric damage, so everyone would benefit from this. I do wish other classes had weapons that could do corrosive damage, because I do think it would be cool if corroded bots had a small chance for their armor plating to melt, revealing additional weak points. But, as it stands, the driller has enough advantages over the bots. Aside from balancing weapon effectiveness, something that could be helpful would be if the bots had a chance to fear Glyphids. I think this makes sense logically because you would think the bugs would see the bots as enemies the same way they do us, and it could be as simple as the way Dreadnoughts suppress Glyphid swarms during elimination missions. As for the turret controller, Misnothus had an idea reminiscent of Lost Gear. Since the issue currently is that the purpose for hacking the controller is to destroy the turrets, but you generally have to destroy the turrets to get to the controller, he thought maybe the controller could be hidden in a small room like the Lost Gear. Instead of the controller in the center of the turrets, there could be something similar to the rival communications router. To reveal the location of the controller, you'd have to shoot or pick three weak points on the router, which would light a cable in the ground to lead you to the room. Once you've entered the room, it would trigger a bot swarm, which would still give you a sense of urgency to hack quickly without having to do it out in the open under turret fire. If you successfully hacked a controller without destroying all the turrets manually, the router would then reveal a data cell. This would give both purpose and incentive to hacking the controller over destroying all the turrets individually, plus all of these mechanics exist in some form already. Well, that's gonna do it for the problem with bots. And I think I've earned a beer at this point. This is Lumberstruck, a black barley wine aged in red wine barrels by Revolution Brewing in Chicago. At the end of the day, even with all the advantages I have as a driller main, unfortunately I'm still just not really a fan. But what do you think? I'm sure you noticed I mentioned Has 5 a lot, and that's because that's really all I play anymore. And obviously there are some night and day differences, even just from Has 4. I took a poll on my community page a little while ago, and I was a little surprised to see that the vast majority of people are fine with the bots exactly the way they are. I know the number of people that play Has 5 is relatively small, so if you haven't experienced the bots on that difficulty level, I could honestly see why you may not have a problem with bots. But if you play Has 5 and you're fine with the bots exactly the way they are, Give me your secrets. I'm sure this will be a fairly controversial topic, so be sure to let me know what you think of all this in the comments. I for one was really surprised to learn a lot of the numbers and mechanics behind the bots. Speaking of which, big massive thank you to Meat Shield for sharing his DRG knowledge, Banagement for helping me with some spawn rates, and especially... For getting me the attack stats for all of the bots. I truly couldn't have made this video without all their help. If you made it this far, please take a moment to like and subscribe, and as always, Rock and Stone, brothers and sisters.